start that because I usually forget. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. I'm Cindy Matsuki with HCDC. I'm the SBIR program manager. And just for a quick overview of what HTDC does, we're the state's tech economic development agency. We support tech and manufacturing in Hawaii. Those are the two industries that we're trying to grow. Um, and we support them by building infrastructure, capital and talent. So we do that with grant funding as well as um, wraparound services. So that is something, and it's, it is for Hawaii companies. <laughs> <laughs> but that is something that we do. And then we also do workshops like this to help our tech and manufacturing companies with services and with opportunities. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And then I'd also like to introduce Alan Badgley with Encounter Innovation. And we've, we're starting to partner with them just to see, I think there's a lot of um, synergies that we could do together, just bringing different people in and different um, capabilities and different types of information. So, Alan. Uh, thanks, Cindy. Uh, I've got with me uh, Bill Carey with Art Technology and our uh, co-founder, if you will, for Encountering Innovation. Uh, so, Bill has uh, been a part of this all along. Most of the folks that uh, work with us in our Encountering Innovation will recognize Bill. Uh, we think we're, uh, thank you very much, Cindy, for working with you. Uh, I think uh, a couple of things. First of all, we hope that we can learn from each other and uh, things that you're doing where we don't have to repeat. Uh, I don't think any of our clients care if we do something that you don't do or vice versa. Why should we both be doing the same thing? So I'm very excited about collaborating with you in a way that you can do stuff and we can uh, bring our clients to you uh, for that, to where we spend less money doing the same thing. Uh, second thing, and I think a part of a big part of what we're hoping for is that our client base can work with your client base uh, in connecting and those collisions that end up uh, expanding business opportunity through manufacturing, uh, technology transfer, and shared uh, capabilities. So that's what we're looking forward to as well. Great. Yes, we're looking forward to that. Okay, so to get to it, we are going to, I'm going to introduce Jennifer. She's our speaker for today. She is the NSWC Corona Orta. I, if that's your official title. She does tech transfer and SBIR with the Federal Laboratories Consortium. And so Jennifer... Thank you so much for being here today. I will, you want me to start your slides? Yes, please, and thank you for having me. Okay, let's see. Cindy's gonna drive so that I can uh, read my, my notes and make sure I cover all this content uh, for you all. Yes, why can't I find your slides? Hang on. Um, I will find it. Okay, here it is. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so this is my introductory slide. So as mentioned, my name is Jennifer Stewart and I have been a public servant for the Department of Navy for 20 years now. Um, I, I serve at Naval Surface Warfare Center Corona Division, which is located in Southern California, and I'm about 95 miles north of San Diego. And in the last 11 years of my career there, I have been in the area of technology transfer as the Office of Research and Technology Applications, otherwise known as the ORTA. That's, you know, government, we love acronyms. Um, so as I go through acronym soup, if there's anything I mentioned that you don't understand, let me know and, and I'll explain it. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna start with just some high level of what is an ORTA and how do they function? 
So the Office of Research and Technology Applications, referred to as ORDA, evolved from the legislation to not only be the office, but essentially a person or persons. The law states that any federal entity that performs research and development and has 200 or more scientists and engineers must have at least one full-time ORTA. So this is at all federal agencies. Um, this is NIH, NSF, uh, USDA, um, Department of Transportation, Department of Defense. And what I think is really brilliant about what Congress did here is when they stated that you had to have a minimum of 200 or more scientists and engineers, what they're really saying is intellectual capital, intellectual capacity. Um, you have these brilliant silver servants that are doing research in their laboratories and who is going to manage the output of that? But even more importantly, who is going to connect the output of that to industry and academia for opportunity? So in that, the ORDA serves as a super connector. We facilitate connections inside and outside of the lab in the creation of powerful cooperation and collaboration. In some ways, you can think of the ORDA as a matchmaker connecting you on the outside and what your needs and vision and goals are to that of the laboratory in which they sit. We really rely on our federal scientists and engineers to find the entities and individuals such as yourselves that they want to partner with. Collaboration cannot be forced. And so it really takes our internal scientists and engineers to have an interest in what you're doing and for you to have an interest in what we are doing and so that we can build a successful collaboration and relationship. Next slide. So I'm just gonna do a brief history of the legislation um, and how it came about. And, and there's about 20 pieces of legislation overall um, that support what we do in technology transfer. And so Congress got this right. Um, the Stephen Wilder Act was created to promote the United States technological innovation for the achievement of national economic, environmental, and social goals and for other purposes. And, and the Bayh-Dole Dole Act was created, is formerly known as the Patent and Trademark Act Amendments, but is a federal law enacted in 1980 that enables universities and nonprofit research institutions and small businesses to own, patent, and commercialize inventions developed under federally funded research programs within their organizations. Next slide. And so as, as Congress rolled out these, these statutes and legislation in 1980, they're saying, we need more. We, it's not achieving the impact um, that we want to see in that return on investment of tax dollar investment. And so in 1986 came about the Technology Transfer Act. And out of that, there was, it was a second piece of legislation that was really focused on technology transfer from federal government agencies to the commercial sector. This act established the Federal Laboratory Consortium of which I am a member, um, and also a board member for the Far West region. And it enabled federal laboratories to enter into CRADA's cooperative research and development agreements and to negotiate licenses for our patent, patented inventions that were made inside of our laboratories. Next slide. So now that we've had some background and history of all this, how can we make it useful to you? And what exactly do, is meant by technology transfer? So before I get to exactly what is technology transfer, I do wanna spend a little time explaining what is a federal laboratory? The federal laboratory is mentioned here on this slide and mentioned throughout my presentation. And what I found is oftentimes uh, people are not so clear on the difference between a national laboratory and a federal laboratory. So you may have heard of national laboratories and possibly new to hearing about federal laboratories. 
National laboratories are government operated research facilities that hold an official national laboratory designation based upon their mission. They are funded by the federal government and are managed by various agencies, such as the Department of Energy. In fact, Department of Energy has 17 national laboratories, so they have the largest national laboratory portfolio of all the federal laboratories. A few other agencies also have laboratories with the national laboratory designation, such as Department of Homeland Security, NASA, and NIH. The federal labs that hold the national laboratory designation conduct scientific research and development specifically related to energy and technology. Now a federal laboratory means any federally funded laboratory, any federally funded research and development center or any cooperative research center or national science foundation research center that was established under the Title 15 code as section 3705 or 3707 that is owned, leased, or otherwise used by a federal agency and funded by the federal government, whether operated by the government or by a contractor. So therefore, all national labs are also federal labs, but not all federal labs are national labs. Does that make sense? And the reason why I got into that definition is to help you understand like your tax dollars at work and the different missions and types of missions that are being funded and how that creates this wealth of laboratories um, for you to partner with and collaborate with. So back to what is technology transfer? Again, our acronyms and, and as abbreviated is T2. It's, it's something that will commonly referred to tech transfer as is T2. And it's the process by which we enable and facilitate outside access to the shareable assets of the federal government. Yes, I said shareable. Our tax dollars invest in mission critical resources. And these resources can be made available to you what through what is called technology transfer. At its core, T2 is about external entities, such as small business or others, reaching into a federal laboratory. And lucky for the federal labs, it can also be used for the labs to reach out to those on the outside within industry and academia in order to assist in achieving research and development goals. One of the tech transfer mechanisms that enables this is the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or CRADA. And today I'm gonna to focus on CRADAs because they are one of the most flexible and powerful tools in the technology transfer toolbox. Next slide. So accessible, and shareable. So what are the federal government shareable assets? Our people, our scientists and engineers, you can have access to them under a CRADA. You can partner and collaborate side by side with them to develop your technology tools and services. Our knowledge, remember I said 200 or more scientists and engineers and what Congress was pointing out there is there's a lot of intellectual capital that can be accessed within the federal laboratories. Our intellectual property, the result of our SME's intellectual capital, those inventions, innovations, and patents, um, you can have access to those through licensing agreements um, and other specialized equipment and facilities. For example, my laboratory has multiple sites um, across the country and our site located in Corona, California, well, specifically Norco, North Corona, California. Um, we have a unique force measurement system and we have companies that pay to use our equipment and they pay like an hourly rate and have our technicians test their equipment in order to meet their government contracts or in performance of their government contracts. 
We also have a massive anechoic chamber um, at our Sill Beach facility that you can have access to, to do testing in. And so all of this specialized equipment and all these specialized facilities across all these different federal agencies, you can have access to, to achieve your goals in technology development. And you can have access to them using a CRADA. So why do we do this? It's to encourage growth in the US industrial base, economic impact, to promote dual use technologies. And when I say dual use technologies, that means technology that can be used both for the federal mission, or in my case, at my laboratory, the Navy mission, as well as uh, be a solution for the private sector and for industry. Everything we do at the lab is funded with our taxpayer money. So where appropriate, it is our mission to maximize that public investment in our laboratory and ensure the greatest value is achieved. We try our best to enable the private sector to leverage these investments to your advantage. Next slide. So what is a CRADA? As you can see here, we can do CRADAs with all sorts of entities, businesses of all sizes, academia, foreign entities, nonprofit, government entities, individuals, other. CRADAs are the means and mechanism given to federal agencies and labs to implement that Stephen Wilder Act, that T2 mandate. It's a new kind of government contract that allows for R&D collaborations between the federal sector and the federal labs and those non-federal parties and entities. A CRADA is not a funding mechanism. So that's something that you need to keep in mind and understand that CRADAs do not allow the federal lab to send money or funds to their collaborator. CRADAs are not to be used to circumvent the FAR-based procurement requirements. So CRADAs are not an alternative to FAR-based procurement. So if you get a federal contract, it will be typically a federal acquisition regulation-based procurement vehicle. A CRADA is a contract, but it is not a FAR-based contract. And the reason why we cannot put funding on a CRADA is because unlike a FAR-based procurement requirement, with a CRADA, we don't have to compete for the partnership. The laboratory can select any partner that is suitable um, for their goals and needs of their mission. And so it's not competed in any way. And thereby, once you don't have that element of competition, we aren't allowed to put money on it because then that would be in contradiction to the FAR-based procurement requirements. But this CRADA is an agreement to facilitate collaboration. It's again, not purchasing of supplies or services or equipment, but it's actually working side by side with you to co-develop. And so it isn't subject to the federal acquisition regulation. In fact, for the most part, FAR rules do not apply to CRADAs whatsoever. The federal labs have that flexibility to choose who they would like to partner with. So while it is not subject to the FAR, it is a legal contract. And there is a preference in the statute towards small businesses and US-based businesses. Additionally, creatives can be used to help transfer government technology and innovations to the private sector. And conversely, a creative can be used to evaluate commercial technology for potential use in a mil military or federal lab mission area application. Creatives are very flexible and negotiable. Next slide. So who contributes what? CRADAs provide a formal mechanism for federal labs to engage with industry and academia. 
who or others who may be able to provide valuable assistance via their personnel, services, facilities, equipment, intellectual property, knowledge, know-how, and expertise that can help achieve the objectives of the CRADA project. We can put personnel on site at a university or at a company at an industry partner's location or vice versa. We can allow access to our facilities and equipment or vice versa. The only thing we can't provide is funding. We can receive funding if there's an element of the CRADA that requires the partner to fund to have access at cost, but we cannot send funding. Sometimes it depends on how the particular agency or laboratory is funded, whether or not costs will be involved with the CRADA. So like a great example is our laboratory at NSWC Corona Division. We're what is called a working capital funded laboratory. And so we get paid by project-based work. We don't have an actual funding line. If you look at the federal budget, there will not be a funding line that goes to our laboratory. We are project-based. And so if our scientists and engineers don't have an internal funding line to support the effort or use of equipment, then our partner would be required to pay at cost whatever costs are involved in operating um, that equipment or participating in the CRADA. However, some labs are um, mission funded at the congressional level. And so they might have funding for a full year to execute their projects and wouldn't require any additional funding. So that is gonna be lab dependent and you will find a lot of variety um, between lab to lab and the labs that you work with under a CRADA. So CRADAs can be used to help transfer that government technology and innovations to the private, private sector. In fact, right now at my lab, we are also working on um, some what is called a limited purpose CRADA. So there's also kind of different flavors of CRADAs um, depending on the agency and lab that you're working with. In fact, NASA, um, they call their CRADA Space Act Agreements. So if you've ever heard of a Space Act Agreement, it's essentially a CRADA. Um, the flavor of CRADA that I mentioned, the limited purpose CRADA, is where we're not doing that side-by-side -side research or collaboration or development, but instead a company could supply us um, equipment or software for us to test, essentially kick the tires, so to speak, and see how does that technology perform? Will it solve uh, the problems or will it be a solution for what we're looking for? And we provide a report you know, here's how it did, here's our assessment. Um, it can also go the other direction. The federal government can supply something for industry to test and to supply a report on. And so it's a great um, market assessment evaluation tool before you get to procurement to actually allow the government to kind of test and see like what solution do you have and is it gonna be the solution that we need? A byproduct of that limited purpose CRADA could be to enter into a standard CRADA where we've identified some of the gaps um, that are in your technology, but now let's work together to fill those gaps to meet the actual defined need. Next slide. So the benefits to the partnering entity, you might wonder, like, if the government can't give me any funding, then what's the incentive, you know, to work with us? Typically, access to our experts, our specialized capabilities, our valuable resources you wouldn't otherwise have access to, and a great reason why you would want to partner. That customer discovery that occurs under a CRADA by working side by side helps to establish relationships and knowledge and know-how that may be leveraged in the future for external funding opportunities. Leveraging the CRADA also reduces the overall cost of R&D because we're sharing resources. 
The partners also receive the option of exclusive commercial rights of any technology developed under the CRADA. And all the company's information is protected under the CRADA. Win-win, right? It's a partner's chance at a monopoly against the competition. The benefits to the federal government is access to SMEs within industry and academia. Building our internal knowledge base. Also, the government will receive government purpose rights to inventions that result from the CRADA. So CRADA requirements. As noted in the name, it must be specific for research and development. A few things to keep in mind on CRADAs is that they are project specific. Just because my laboratory has a CRADA, let's say with General Electric, doesn't mean that we can use the same CRADA for other projects or other agencies. So they are, you will have the CRADA with the specific organization um, that you will be working with. In summary, a CRADA is an excellent technology transfer tool. It provides incentives that help speed the commercialization of federally developed technology. It protects any proprietary information brought into the CRADA relationship by the partner. It allows all the parties to the CRADA to keep research results emerging from the CRADA confidential and free from disclosure through the Freedom of Information Act for up to five years allows the government and the partner to share patents and patent licenses, and it permits the partner to retain exclusive rights to a patent or patent license. Next slide. Creative process and uses. So as I mentioned, you will find differences from lab to lab and agency to agency. Each individual you work with will operate differently. They'll have different templates, different forms, different processes, different requirements. On average, from start to finish, across the federal government, you'll see an average time of about three months uh, to establish a CRADA. That really depends on how long you're negotiating terms of the CRADA, um, how much legal involvement there is on each side. Going through those legal reviews can add time um, to the process. The federal laboratory that you're working with will be responsible for drafting that CRADA. Um, and the terms are negotiable. And so if there's something that you don't particularly care for in their standard CRADA language, um, you can negotiate that and there's flexibility to come to terms that you can agree with within the CRADA. The reason why there's so many differences from lab to lab and agent agency is no government wide regulations exist. Each agency can issue its own regulations to implement the law. And the lab director maintains that great discretion on whether to collaborate and what terms that they'll collaborate under. Each agency's R&D missions differ greatly. You know, some focus on spinning out technology like USDA, while others are interested in spinning in technology to meet their missions or have a higher security concern such as DOD and NSA. And then the practices differ from agency and lab to lab. And a big factor is just personality. Personality of the agency's legal staff, you know, may, one may be more risk averse or conservative in interpretation of the law than others. Um, while the law authorizes a broad range of cooperative R&D arrangements, some agencies are more concerned with uniformity and just keeping their creative practices within that box. Another um, requirement is that the CRADA must be compatible with that federal laboratory's mission and present no conflict of interest for the federal lab or its research project staff and be acceptable to all federal labs approval authorities. Work is usually supported um, 
by contributions from all partners in the CRADA and a partner can fund the lab for their work to be performed. Like I mentioned, like in my laboratory, being a working capital funded organization, sometimes we can do no funds in CRADAs and sometimes there's aspects of the CRADA that would be need to be funded by the partner because we don't have any other means um, to fund the work. The costs are always at fair market value or otherwise determined by that lab laboratory's labor rates or equipment use rates. No laboratory can make a profit. Um, and so you're really just paying whatever their overhead and costs are. Again, that proprietary information provided to the federal laboratory by you um, is protected from disclosure for up to five years. And you will see that language outlined in the CRADA agreement itself. Typical size of a CRADA agreement could be like our Navy template, standard template is like 16 pages. Um, and so within that, you'll see, you know, disclosure protections, intellectual, intellectual property protections, um, as well as that detailed outline, that statement of work of what it is you'll be collaborating on and um, what the, the different deliverables of the CRADA for both parties are. Now, under the CRADA, the collaborators is granted the first option to take a license on reasonable commercial terms for any inventions made by the federal laboratory inventors or researchers or jointly made by the federal lab and the collaborator under the CRADA. And whether you're getting a license under a CRADA or whether you're negotiating a patent license agreement to just have permission to use one of the federal government's inventions, in either case, um, commercial products resulting from the CRADA developed intellectual property must be substantially manufactured in the United States. But that can also, you can still meet that requirement based just on the current state of the art, um, current practices of what manufacturing is available. The CRADA will be worked through an ORDA office or some labs call it a technology partnership office. There might be a few other names, but it's not worked under the contracting office. So contracting office handles all of the FAR-based um, acquisition contracts, your technology transfer office, your ORDA, your technology partnerships office. We handle all the non-FAR-based types of agreements and contracts, including creatives. So you would be working with a me um, within any federal laboratory that you decide to enter into a CREA with. Next slide. And so this is pretty self-explanatory. You have a principal investigator on both sides, but you can have multiple individuals involved in the CRADA. And the, these individuals would be the primary POCs. I would connect you as a PI to the Corona PI, let's say if we're doing a CRADA at my lab, to have you sit across the table from each other or across the, the, the Zoom meeting and talk about and build that statement of work. It's not built in a silo. These are very open communication, very collaborative. There's no point um, under the CREDA at which there's a silence period like in developing a FAR contract. This is meant to be side by side um, working together to put the terms together for what it is you want to accomplish. Some of the things you have to manage are things like data marking and exchange of documentation, um, completing any kind of reporting requirements that are required. For example, um, Department of Navy, you know, with, we want within a year, a report of what happened, what, what were the results of this CRADA, um, what, intellectual property was potentially created? What were the outcomes of this partnership and collaboration? Next slide. So the creative state of mind, 
I like to refer as, you know, FAR acquisition regulation and contracting is a giant stack of processes and requirements. And CRADA is much more simplified and agile. And you still have to take into consideration security, of course. And um, at my laboratory, I work with a, a primary security officer just to make sure that the content um, that's being shared and created meets security requirements, that we're protecting things um, on both sides the way we should be. Um, and, uh, but it's more agile. It's less like government and more like business. And the terms that are within the CRADA are very business friendly. And you're free to talk about what you want to do and build that plan um, with the partner. And so I don't know, Cindy, if you would be able to share um, a video, but I thought this FLC video here is a great summary of um, accessing federal lab technology transfer or federal lab technology. Will I let you click on the link there? It won't, but I will, um, once I stop sharing, I'll grab the link and throw it in the chat. Okay, great. Is that okay? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. When I tested it last night, it was letting me do the control and start and I would play it, but. Let me, let me try. Oh, actually, let me see. Like if you hover control to follow, click the link. Oh, oh, oh. Can you guys see that? It did start playing. Probably just have to share that screen. Yeah. Okay, hang on. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay. All right. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. GoPro's highly versatile action cameras help millions of people capture their adventures in ways never before possible. But we just lost audio though. To explore what kind of technology is available, the Federal Laboratory Consortium for Technology Transfer, or FLC, has developed FLC Business, a one-of-a-kind web-based tool that makes finding federal laboratory resources easy in a simple-to-search database. Here you'll find thousands of technologies available for licensing, local laboratory facilities and equipment for public use, and subject matter experts who you can reach out to for advice. You can even identify business development programs and funding opportunities. And for more personalized service, you can call the FLC's technology locator to help you find what you need and guide you through the process. Now that you've found the resource you're interested in, FLC Business helps you contact the lab representative directly to explore your options. You can license federal technologies and manufacture them or use them in your products or business processes. Fully collaborate and share resources with federal labs on a joint project. Use federal material, equipment, or facilities. Get assistance from a scientist employed at a federal lab. Engage the lab to perform testing or other work for you. It's as simple as that. Search for what you need at FLC Business. Connect with a lab. Engage with experts. Start the right technology transfer process to meet your business's needs. Visit flcbusiness.com today. Sorry, I were you able to hear it? Actually, the audio came in at the right time, so. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, sorry. I think I had to unmute myself. 
what do you guys uh, think? But anyway, we're gonna um share the slide deck, which will have yeah. the link. So share the slide and the link, and then the next link again, and the next slide, create a success story. I won't have you play that video, um, but again, folks, we'll have the slide deck and you can share it. And it talks about um, a recent success um, under a CRETA for clean water to Puerto Rico, um, hurricane victims. And then I'll just overview, next slide. A great success story from our laboratory. So NICE funded, NICE is an internal R&D funding for our scientists and engineers to use to, to advance projects. Um, and so it resulted in an invention. I collaborated with the University of Maryland um, School of Business. They were running at NSF i um, which i is where you take entrepreneurs and you go through the lean startup methodology and customer discovery. And from their results from that were so favorable um, that they formed a startup company around our technology. We licensed uh, that invention to them and then entered into a CRADA so that we could further support the development of the technology for their market uses. And they've since sold some samples um, to a mid-sized UUV company. They also have won multiple SBIR phase one, phase two awards. Um, and continue to partner with our inventor on the development of that tool, of that technology. Next slide. So some great CRADA resources for you is TechLink, techlinkcenter.org. I have the website here. Now TechLink is funded by Department of Defense as a partnership in a meet area. And so if you want to shop all the technology that's available for license out of DOD, um, including my lab at NSWC Corona, and you know, looking at the inventions that come out of the labs also gives you insight into what are those labs working on and where those potential CRADA opportunities are that align with what your company is doing. And then the FLC, um, Federal Lab Consortium at federallabs.org, that's where you will find an FLC learning center to learn about all these different mechanisms and kind of get a feel for what they might look like from agency to agency. Um, and then and federal and the um, federal or FLC business, which is currently being revamped. Um, I believe our launch date is sometime in June. But in, in that tool, you can actually shop for individuals. You can see every order, every tech transfer office across the federal government and their contact information. You can shop patents from across all agencies um, and all the different partnership opportunities. Next slide. So in summary, we're better together. There isn't there is an unlimited amount of funding within the federal government, although sometimes looking at our budgets, it seems like there's a lot of money to be um, put into action, but there is a limit. And, but however, we have unlimited number of problems to solve. And so working creatively and making use of all these tools that our legislature has provided us is smart, the creation of shared value is at this intersection of win-win where all parties involved benefit. This is a way to create shared investment to maximize output and drive down costs of solutions. Technology transfers at the center of these collaborative intersections. Next slide. And here is my contact information and uh, the deputy order at my laboratory, Don Child, his contact information. And so if you have any reason why you'd like to get in touch with me or if you'd like to, me to help you further shop or navigate um, the Federal Laboratory Consortium resources or the TechLink resources, I'd be happy to do that and answer any questions you have. And with that, do we have any questions today or topics of discussion?
Um, you can feel free to, oh, Jay. Hi. Question? Yeah, hi. I've been involved with Department of Energy and federal laboratories for 32 years doing technology commercialization. And one of the hangups that I have is that, Jennifer, you didn't really talk about the impact of the overhead markup on a small business. Because at least at the Department of Energy, the uh, overhead number now is somewhere in the range of four and a half to five. So that if I put $100 into the lab, if I, if I, if I put $1,000 into the lab, uh, potentially $80, 80, $800 of that goes to overhead and $200 of that goes to the actual work uh, SME, the, the scientist who's going to be collaborating with my business. So working with the national laboratories or the federal laboratories is an expensive proposition. It de it's lab dependent. So like, for example, majority of the creatives that I've entered into, our scientists had internal funding that supported and that covered their costs. And so we have a lot of no funds in creatives. So each party has agreed to cover their own costs. But like I said, from agency to agency and lab to lab, you're gonna encounter differences there in terms of requirements. Some laboratories will not enter into a CREDA unless it is funded by the partner. Um, and then Department of Energy, you're looking at government owned contractor operated facilities. And so whatever that con operating contractors requirements are, I do believe like DOE, um, you can't do, you have to fund everything up front. You can't do a payment process or like a milestone payment process, pay as you go. And so you will have to work through that with each individual laboratory. There's also the intellectual property question of who owns what if it's federally funded uh, money. I realize that if you're dealing with a shared, price, shared costs, that may be different. But in the case of a Department of Energy laboratory where it's full funds in, uh, intellectual property developed with federal money, the lab is essentially going to own that IP and the small business is going to have to license that back. Yes, again, the terms will be determined by the laboratory. Um, you know, inventorship is inventorship regardless but then you do have title or rights that can be negotiated. So if you're a co-inventor on something, you're a co-inventor on something that doesn't change terms in any way. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Hi there. Um, my name is Claudia Lamb, um, and uh, we've developed like a decentralized communication platform. Um, we actually already have the patents um, on that, um, both design and software. Um, and so how, how does that actually work from an IP perspective? Because I sure. mean, it's filed, it's in our name. If we were to partner... Um, what does that mean? And then I guess the the second question was really around, you mentioned that you're not a source of, of funding, um, but how, how does it actually play out with deciding really how, what the price tag is on say, developing the technology? Sure. So Within Department of Navy, our CREDA template, and as we're building the different terms within the CREDA, we list what intellectual property the partner is bringing to the table and that they own completely and solely. Um, and it's all already listed as that is the entity's property. We do not get to take rights in what you came into the relationship with. And separately, we'll list what the government brings to the table and any intellectual property that's involved in the collaboration. Then if there's something that's jointly created, that if there's additional intellectual property that is created under the CREDA, 
then you have the negotiation of the licensing and the rights to that. But what you bring into it is outlined in the CRADA is, hey, this is what my company created and this is what we're going to bring into this relationship and we own the rights to this. Nobody else owns the rights to this. Um, so that's all stated and clear. Um, and then again, those terms based upon the outcome of that are negotiable. And so if there's jointly created intellectual property, it will be negotiated in the CRADA and under the CRADA um, and any licensing can also be um, developed and negotiated under the CRADA as well. Um, in terms of not being able to fund, what I have seen is the result of the CRADA could be something that the federal government wishes to procure in the future. And so there are different ways to go about that. If you think that the results of the CRADA are going to be something that the government wants to procure, or even that CRADA partner will want to procure at the end of, of the CRADA performance, then we can list the CRADA as an opportunity on um, SAM.gov because what we don't want to have happen is in the procurement process down the road for there to be a bid protest by a competitor saying they had an unfair advantage because they had a CRADA. And so if we think that there is potential procurement of the CRADA solution, then I'll check that box by widely advertising the CRADA opportunity. Um, and so that way, multiple entities have the opportunity um, to state how they would be interested in performing a CRADA. And we can then review it and make our CRADA partner selection um, based on that. And that's just a contract attorney way um, of addressing any potential bid protests down the line if there were to be a procurement involved um, in the CRADA, but a CRADA does not guarantee you a FAR-based procurement in the future. But what it does do is it informs the government engineers and scientists on technological solutions or have co-created solutions for government use. Does that answer your question? No. Uh, yes, it does, yeah, thank you. Hey, I had a quick question, Jennifer. So yeah. do people use, so like if you're planning to propose an SBIR, could you do a CRADA with, um, I guess a lab where you can have experts that will agree to work with you? And can you do it conditionally? So like, if you don't get the SBIR? Yeah, so that's um, a good question. Um, so at least in the Department of Navy, and I'm not sure about how the other agencies handle this, but in the Department of Navy, when you are applying for an SBIR, we are prohibited from doing like a letter of intent or a letter of support. It actually reflects poorly on the application. If a lab says, hey, if this company gets an SBIR, we'll do a CRADA with them. Um, and that dates back to some, some issues in the past where there was kind of this quid pro quo type optic going on where labs were saying, hey, if you, you know, and even just the optic of it, right? If, if you do a credit with us, you're guaranteed an SBIR, or let's put it in that, in that proposal. Um, and so there was a time where um, there was a complete prohibition, a legislative stop on any company that had an SBIR from also entering into a CRADA for the same subject. So you don't wanna blur those lines or have those optics issues. They did release that um, prohibition and do allow CRADA activity to support the research under an SBIR. And it doesn't have to be with the same agency or entity that owns the SBIR topic. In fact, it's better if it's not, because then you get even further from those optics issues. So for example, if USDA 
as fun and as they are and you have a cyber topic with them, but maybe there's an Air Force laboratory or a Navy laboratory that has equipment or, or expertise in an area that you need access to in order to achieve the goals of your SBIR topic, then you can enter into a CRADA um, to support that effort. So does that make sense? I think so. So is it something that you would you could still do before you're awarded? Before, during, after, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you just can't use it. it. You know, SBIR is fair and open competition, just like mm -hmm. bar based procurement. And so um, the concern there is if a laboratory or agency, if there's the optic of saying, hey, do this credo with us, you'll also get the SBIR. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. having any kind of letters written from the laboratory suggesting that is also kind of a negative um, towards that optic. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking that, you know, a lot of times these smaller companies don't have some of the expertise that they need that could help them. Absolutely. The are too. Even equipment, you know, the cost mm -hmm. of some of the research equipment to buy it and operate it yourself, mm -hmm. where if you could have access to it under a CRADA um, or even just the, the option of another type of agreement where you just pay to use. Mm -hmm. um, is also, I think, more economical oftentimes. Universities often have similar mm -hmm. um, arrangements where you can pay to use their equipment or facilities. Um, again, like the other gentleman mentioned that you need to look at terms, you know, what implications of using that equipment at a university or another center, what intellectual property um, terms, title or rights come accompany to that contract. Um, you know, like I have seen even just in our researchers wanting to partner with academia and utilize equipment, that particular piece of equipment may have been under an endowment or um, some other organization or company funded that procurement mm -hmm. and have attached anything, any inventions resulting from use of this equipment we have um, rights to. And so those are oh things gosh. that you need to read through. <laughs> Um, and understand and negotiate. Yeah. Wow, good to good to know. Lot to navigate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there any more questions? We have a minute left. If anyone has anything, no. Okay. So I wanted to thank everybody for coming and thank you so much, Jennifer. That was amazing. I learned so much. And I think this is a huge resource that I think not enough of our companies are taking advantage of. And I do appreciate the offer of you being a resource to our companies and helping them navigate through some of these things. Um, and I just want to let everybody know, I will be sending out um, a link to the video as well as Jennifer's slide deck. And um, please sign up on our website if you want to see our newsletters and announcements for any upcoming workshops as well. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate everybody's time, taking the time, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you, Alan, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining <laughs> us. All right. Aloha. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye.